Thanks for reading that. That's going to be our text for the message this morning. And uh, we've been working our way through the book of Ephesians, verse by verse and line by line. And uh, Chad, I appreciate the other Sunday, the word that you brought to us. Um, it's very encouraging to see what God is doing for the body of Christ and how he's equipping us and that we all have a place to, to, to grow and to learn and to live together. And I hope that in Christ, um, as this church grows and matures and more people find us, we will also begin to take advantage of the giftings that God has given each one of us and become a part of what, what God wants to do for us here and with us here in Potsdam. So, Father, as we look into your word, I trust that your presence is with us. By faith, we walk with you, believing that you have filled us with your spirit and that you desire to lead and guide us. Thank you for taking us by the hand and drawing us to yourself in intimacy and in love. Help us now to focus for just a few minutes on what you have to say to us and give us the ability to process and understand so that we can respond back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> so the study today is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. And it's going to be kind of an interesting subject. But I think it's going to be interesting because it directly affects the culture and the life that we are living today within this culture. It starts with the word therefore. Now I know Thomas, or Tom, when he was here, Todd, when he preached, he said, what does the word therefore mean? And I, I watched the video, and uh, he's like, come on, answer, anybody, anybody? <laughs> um, and he, the, the point of therefore is to, to find out what it's there for. There's a reason that the word therefore exists in Scripture. Because it always refers back to something that was just said in Scripture before. So that's the lesson that we learned about context in Scripture. Whenever someone gives you a verse and says, well, this is what the Bible says, and just gives a verse outside of the context that it's in, always be a little bit suspicious. I always think, okay, wait a minute. What's going on here? What's the context that it's found in? And does it really mean what you say it means? Be suspicious. Always be suspicious when someone comes and drops a verse out of the blue to maybe explain their behavior or whatever. We're going to find that a little bit further out in this passage. That people use empty words to excuse why they say and do certain things. And you've probably experienced this and maybe you've done the same thing already. And so we want to be careful about that. So the word therefore be imitators of God. Therefore, what's it there for? Well, look in verse 32 from last week. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So God did something through Christ. Therefore, be imitators of those things. See, be imitators of God. What did God do? He forgave. He was kind. He was tenderhearted. Uh, and he forgave us. Do you see how that works? So that's what we are imitating. That is the direction that we want to go. Be imitators of God as beloved children. So how are we to imitate God? To be kind. To be tenderhearted. To be forgiving one another. Now, this is difficult when people act unfairly towards us. Now, I think in our minds often we think, well, we're thinking about the big sins. When someone really does something nasty to us. But how about the little sins? How about the little slights? Or the little white lies that get spoken? Or the misunderstandings where you're just frustrated with someone? Should we forgive those too? Or should we seek justice? And insist that that person come to grips with what they have done to me. In this German culture, the thing that I'm noticing more and more and more is that people, and I've talked about this many times already, and I'll talk about it some more, they insist upon their rights. And if you trample on their rights even a little bit, they will become furious with you. Yesterday we were driving, and this, and I guess a car, we were, we were making a left turn onto the, onto the 100 and um, there's two lanes that turn and then it merges into one. Well, the outside lane, apparently there was a new driver there and he didn't know to go and he was kind of worried about missing his turn. So the guy behind him started honking at him. 
Well, then infuriated the guy in front of him, so he starts honking back. So we have this honking going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, all the way down the ramp, all the way onto the Highway 100, and it just keeps on going. There's just honking tit for tat, for tit for tat. And then finally, the guy in the Miles car, it was an electric car, zooms ahead and it stops. And you know, there was there was no forgiveness, there was no tolerance. There's that I'm insisting on my rights. You honk at me, I'm honking back at you. You stepped on my toes. You extrapolate that into every area of life, and now you got a big problem, right? So where we live, we have a parking lot behind our building, and then there's a long driveway that goes out, crosses a very busy sidewalk onto a street. There's no room for error. It's a very narrow single lane. And when you're coming out, if someone's coming in, you're kind of stuck, unless one of you does something. Well, so I'm pulling out, I'm already across the sidewalk trying to go into the street, and a guy decides he wants to turn where I'm going. Well, he happens to have an empty parking spot right by him, all he has to do is back up this far, and I can go. But no, you know what he wants me to do? He wants me to back all the way up to the back of my building so that he can assert his right because he was there after me. And in his mind, first, I guess. Maybe German counts backwards. I'm not sure. But the idea is I had to stop and look at him like, dude, for crying out loud, one of us has to do something and... It'll take you two seconds to just back up one foot. So he finally did because I kept creeping closer and we moved forward. But his insistence was just incredulous to me. Now here's what the choice was for me. Was like, did I get mad at him? Well, not this time. <laughs> but sometimes I do because I still struggle with this whole thing as rights just like they do. And so it's easy to point fingers and look at a culture or a people and say, well, that's the way they are. Well, it's true, but guess what? It's also the way we are. And so we need to be as God is, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. I could have taken that personally. I didn't this time. So that's un a bit unfairly. So how to move on, it says, as beloved children. Do you think that Apostle Paul put that in there just to make sure he had the word count up enough so that he could submit his paper to get a grade? No. There's a reason. As beloved children, how does viewing ourselves as beloved children make a difference in how we walk in this life and how we forgive others and how we're tender hearted and how we're kind? How does that work? Like if you are a person that's always being abused and not forgiven and blamed and being treated unfairly, is it going to be natural for you to turn around and be kind and tender hearted and forgiving to other people? No, that's not natural. We have behavior that comes from the essence of who we are. So if we are not beloved children, and we are just the, the ugly stepchildren, like the whole Cinderella story is kind of absurd. The way she was treated, and yet she turned around and treated everybody so kindly. That's Disney, that's magic. The truth is, a person that's treated that way usually in turn treats the people around them in the very same way. But God turned that whole thing on its head. We treated God like garbage, and we rebelled against Him. We are dark with our sin, and God in His grace and mercy saved us and loved us and forgave us through His grace. And now He expects us to operate from that same base of operations. So the difference being beloved children is massive. But here's the deal. If we don't incorporate that thinking in the way we live, we will become just like everybody else, tit for tat, revenge, not forgiving, not kind, sarcastic. All the things that we think are so fun and funny on TV is how we live in real life. And on TV, it always resolves itself at the end, but in our life, it doesn't. It breaks relationships. It causes all kinds of issues. It causes pain and hardship for other people. So we imitate God by doing what He does from the basis of being beloved children. Isn't that beautiful? It's a wonderful expression of our identity in Christ. But he doesn't stop there. He says, but walk and walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This reminds me of Galatians 5.16. Before we did this series in Ephesians, we studied through the book of Galatians. And in Galatians 5.16, he talks about walking in the Spirit. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires 
of the flesh. The, main, the word walk means to make one's way, progress, a continual, habitual habit. So we see here that love is an action, but it's also a person. And walk in love as Christ loved us. God is love. And he poured his love out by giving us Christ. And Christ, by his actions, demonstrated the reality of that love. Love is not just an abstract contract, concept. It is a, a literal concept. And Christ embodies all of that. And so we see the example of Christ now. And that he gave himself up. Remember last week we talked about, some of you weren't here last week, but some of you that were here, remember we talked about the suit of clothing, you know, put off the old self and to be renewed in your mind and put on the new self. The old self is like that old set of clothes that we wore, that we were born with. We take that suit of clothes off and we set it aside. And we take the new set, the righteousness, the new man, the new Adam, and we put that on. And that is our new identity. How cool does it feel to have a nice well-fitting set of clothes. It changes how you think about yourself. You look in the mirror and you're like, yeah, I look good. And you know that because you look good when you walk out, everybody else is going to think you look good. Uh, at least that's what you're hoping, right? <laughs> it doesn't always happen. But that's what God has done for us. He has preloaded us when we trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. He preloads us with his righteousness and His goodness, and His kindness. It doesn't automatically come out. We have to choose it. But it's all there in 2 Peter chapter 1. It tells us that He has given us everything we need for spiritual success. That's my paraphrase of that verse. So when we put on the new set of clothes and we make that our identity, I'm a beloved child. I have a new set of clothes. I'm stepping out in this new set of clothes. I'm going to operate according to the truth of this new set of clothes. It changes everything about how we live. Absolutely everything. And then when sin comes and tempts us, we have a choice to make. Well, are we going to live according to our old set of clothes that we left at home in the closet? Hopefully never to put on again, which unfortunately we do all the time. Or are we going to live according to the new set of clothes, the new things that God has given us, the new self that He has provided us with. So when we use the example of Christ and walk according to our new identity, this becomes a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. And this is an allusion to the sacrifices that Israel used to make in the Old Covenant. And one of the things that happened, I've been studying this recently, is they would pour incense over it and all kinds of things. And the smoke coupled together with incense would, would literally make its way up through the tabernacle or through the temple and it would be a sweet smelling smell to God. God apparently likes burning flesh. I mean, that's just, apparently, I, I mean, I thought of that. I was like, that's weird. I don't know. I mean, I like grilling and smoking meat, but burning it, that's, that's, that's a, a warning sign to me. But for some reason, God has chosen that this is pleasing to him, a pleasing sacrifice. Here's what I want you to catch in this. We think that our goodness and our religiosity and going to church and just being a good person all around is what pleases God and is a sacrifice to Him that, that makes Him happy. It does. But you know what really is pleasing to Him? is when people are unfair to us. When people persecute us. When we go through suffering. When we experience temptations. And we respond according to the new suit of clothes. When we respond according to imitating Christ and God and we fight through the battle and we have this thing going on in our lives where we're like oh this temptation to to lust or this temptation to lie or this temptation to just waste my time or whatever but I'm gonna go do it anyways I'm gonna do the right thing and I'm gonna forgive and I'm not gonna be mad I'm not gonna cuss I'm not gonna you yell or honk my horn unnecessarily I'm talking about myself now. <laughs> and we do that, then God goes, ah, yeah, that's what I created him for. That's why I gave him a new suit of clothes. This is glorifying to me. It's in that moment that we realize everything that God has done for us. And we realize that 
our actions in the midst of these trials is where God receives the most glory. He's not impressed when everything's going fine and our bank account's full and, and you know, we're laying on the beach in Hawaii and we're having good thoughts about the ocean. Oh, God, I love you. Your creation's so amazing. That's not, I don't think, I'm not God, so in my opinion, it could be completely false. But I don't think that impresses him as much as a guy who's in the inner city struggling with going into the strip club or not and deciding to turn around and go home to be with his wife where he should be. That's where the righteousness of Christ kicks in and is a visceral, visceral reminder of what Jesus did to take a spiritually dead person and make them spiritually alive. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. That's more intense. Continue on verse 3. But, and now it leads into <laughs> sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So how do we live? with this new suit of clothes. Well, these actions are not part of the new suit of clothes. They're attached to the old suit of clothes. That's what they're attached to. So it's not proper. The word but is used as denoting opposition to the preceding statements. None of these things described here goes along with the new suit. It is in direct opposition. It's contrary to God. It's contrary to the design that God put into each and every one of us. In fact, if we have time, we'll get through the idea of this twisted image of God that happens when we use our bodies sexually in a way that displeases Him. That's twisting the image of God and is bringing the world to destruction. And that's where the wrath of God comes in. It's how we twist what God made perfect and whole into whatever we want, into a distorted image of who God is. So it continues here, the sexual immorality is talking about, the Greek word is pornea, used in the Bible to describe adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, and even intercourse with animals. I mean, ugh, gives you the shivers. But that's what he's talking about in the Greek. That's what he was referring to. And interestingly, the word pornography comes from this word. Pornography is an illustration of all of those things. And it is incredibly, uh, I don't even know how to say this, but it's depravity at an incredible level. And when we indulge in pornography, and it's all around us, we know this. And it's not just relegated to men anymore. Women, too, are flocking to pornography for different reasons. But it's depicting something incredibly twisted about what God has created and is using it for depravity. So this word impurity, well, where does that fit in? Well, the word impurity is moral uncleanness, twistedness. This would include things that are not overtly sexual, with someone like viewing porn, lustful thoughts, living for pleasure, flirting with sexual temptation. So we have sexual morality where it's two, two people or a person, an animal or an object or whatever that are doing this thing. The impurity is the thoughts, it's the twistedness in our minds, Um, it's the how we live, not necessarily with another person. So he's covering both bases, basically saying all of these things with these two words. And then the word covetousness, you know what that word means? To covet. It's not being content with what you have. An obsessive desire for something you can't have. So see how that distinguishes it? Like, it's good to have, want something. Like, maybe in a couple of years, I'm going to want a better car because my car is getting pretty long in the tooth and it's going to leave me on the road someday. That's not, I'm not obsessed about this car that's coming. But if I'm obsessed, it's like, I have to have an Audi or a Mercedes or something to replace my Honda. Okay, that's covetousness. Man, I really wish I had a smart car like Chad does. Okay, that's maybe not. What's in a Mercedes? So it, it, it works. <laughs> not really. Okay, <laughs> you get what I'm saying. <laughs> that's what covetousness means. So all of these behaviors indicate that you don't believe in the character and ability of God to be all that He has promised to be and to have done for you all that He has said He has done. Listen to this. We execute these behaviors because we want something that doesn't belong to us and are more concerned about how it makes us feel excited and high. 
Covetousness, sexual immorality, and impurity are all ways that we get something that doesn't belong to us. Whether it's another man, or another woman, or another car, or a certain feeling, or, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. None of these things are going, hey God, I'm really content with who you are, and I know you have something good for me, and I'm just going to wait for you to bring it to me, and I'm going to be patient. I'm going to use the patience that you've put inside of me by your power to wait for it. We go, no, I want it now. I want to feel this way right now. I want this thing right now. I'm going to go into 30,000 euros worth of debt to buy this thing. And now that I have it, oh, I'm awesome. And my life is the best. And oh, it's kind of the same. I'm just driving a better car. That's it. And that's how deceptive this thinking, this lifestyle is. So back to, to, to the sex thing, talking about sex. The exclusive purpose of sex as designed by God is that in the bonding together of the husband and wife in a one flesh relationship. And he, this is what God has established. This isn't just me coming up with a, a random idea. This is what God designed sex for in the garden, in the very beginning. Husband and wife together. There's something wonderfully incredible about that. My wife and I are going to be celebrating 30 years of marriage next year. And um, the sexual part of our relationship is extremely important. It sets the tone for almost everything in our life. And if you're married, you'll know that. It's a big part of it. And the problems there can be problems in the marriage. And so God knew what he was doing when he created sex to be part of marriage. But when we take it out of the context of marriage and we twist it and we use it for our own gratification, we will always suffer the consequences of that action. Even in a marriage, if you are in the context of a marriage, you're like, oh, well, great, then sex is totally fine. But if you're doing it for your own gratification and not for the gratification of the other person, you're not serving the other person, you're still twisting the purpose of sex. Now, I know most of you in this room are not married, so this is new to you, but it's good for you to learn this. In marriage, sex isn't just about finally getting what you want. It's about pouring yourself out on behalf of the other person. And here's the beauty of it. If that other person has the same mindset of pouring themselves out on the, for the purpose of gratifying you, you both get what you want. But you're not the one getting it. You're not the one taking it. You're just receiving it. And it's way better to receive it than to try to get it from somebody. Because when you, when you try to get it, then you start to manipulate. You start to put pressure on people. There's all kinds of things that happen. And so, just to, I mean, this isn't, the sermon isn't about, you know, an education on sex and marriage and stuff like that. But I just wanted to bring that in. That there is a design. God loves sex. He created it. There's a purpose for it. But we need to wait for it until we're with the person that God allows us to marry. And when we're in that marriage relationship, then you develop that side of your life. It's not time to develop before you're married. It's time to develop after you're married. That's the proper place. So the Apostle Paul is warning us, these things must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Who are the saints? Those who've experienced the forgiveness, the love, and the kindness of God. But then it goes even further in verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be saying, uh, thanksgiving. So this foolish talk, the Greek word for this is morologia. And I, had to, like, I thought, well, foolish talk, yeah, okay, I know what that means. And I thought, well, maybe I don't know what that means. And I didn't. I was totally wrong. I'm glad I looked it up. It says, it's a tendency to talk about other people in a negative way. Now get this. To humorously insult a person. So it's a little different. To ridicule someone. Boy, I didn't like, I should have just ignored that because I like to be sarcastic. <laughs> if I could just be honest. Just for a moment, let me be transparent. I like to have some fun with a person. Uh, and God has shown me that I, I, I need to put this aside and I've been working on it. But to take something that's maybe true and then exaggerate it and have some fun with it. 
And um, that's foolish talk. It's not becoming to a saint. And I think we all do this to a certain degree, to, you know. And, and, and when you're among friends and stuff, it starts off as innocent, kind of fun stuff. But we need to be careful that it doesn't go into anything further than that. Because that's not becoming a saint. It's not, it doesn't add to the conversation. It doesn't add to being a blessing one to another. So that's what that word foolish talks means. But it goes further. It talks about filthiness. Okay. Um, let me go back to where I am here. Sorry. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking. So this filthiness is now moving into the shameful, to the obscene. Would Christ be pleased with what you are talking about? And I think, you know, the presence of God, he's always with us, but we forget. We're like, well, you know, he was probably busy, you know, doing something else. So I can, I can say this real quick and, and he's not going to judge me immediately. No, probably not. But he might. But this, this talk about sexual things, and in crude joking, often sexual, vulgar sexual words or toilet humor is used in this crude joking. Maybe you're not guilty of that. I was. I used to joke, joke like that all the time because I thought it was hilarious. There's some comedians that make their entire living joking about these things. Here's the problem. I still find it funny. And if I see a short on YouTube or something, and I, and I watch that, I'm like, ha that's funny. Oh, there I go again, laughing at something that's completely inappropriate. And when it's inappropriate, it goes in my head, and then I have to text Chad, and I have to send him the same thing so he can be single. <laughs> <laughs> that has never happened, has I it? Never lot, though. You liar. <laughs> <laughs> What are the what are the emoji the emojis with the with the eye, crying eyes and all that? Is that you crying or is that you laughing? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but the opposite of all this nasty talk is Thanksgiving. Have you ever been with somebody and maybe you haven't? Uh, every once in a while I've tried this when I've been cognizant of it, but someone talking like that, and then I turn around and say, Hey, you know, but but. Thank, I'm really thankful to God for what he has accomplished here and what he is doing. It just shuts down all the vulgar jokes. It's like, oh, I'm talking about something else all of a sudden. How did this happen? But that's what he's saying is the antidote to these things is thanksgiving. You know? We're just, we're just um, pleasing ourselves when we tell these jokes or when we speak this way. We're just simply, maybe we're deflecting off of our insecurities and our weaknesses. Maybe, I mean, there's all kinds of things that could be happening. We could, we could spend hours talking about that. But the idea here is these things are not good for those who are saints in the kingdom of God. And that's us. But it goes even further in verse 5. It says this, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. All right, this is a bit of a difficult saying, and it's said two other places in Scripture. And some people have taken this verse out of this context and said, okay, well, anybody who's like that has lost their salvation. Okay? It's not talking about losing your salvation. If you look in Romans chapter 8, and we're going to do this because I want us to see this very clearly. In Romans chapter 8, verse 37. <clears throat> Thirty-seven through thirty-nine says, "No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord." So these things don't separate us. So he can't be referring to that, because the Apostle Paul is consistent with his theology. He would not be bringing up something that would be contrary to anything else that's going on. So what is going on? Well, here's another proof that I want to show you in Colossians chapter 3, <coughs> verse 5. Colossians 3, 5. It says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. The context of this is talking to believers, to saints. He's saying, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality. Oh, that's what we're talking about, right? Directly. Impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. It's almost like 
he was thinking the same thoughts when he wrote that as, as he was in Ephesians when he wrote that. So it can't be that us as believers can't have these thoughts. So what does he mean by not inheriting uh, the kingdom of Christ and of God? Well, if you look at the context, he's talking about filthiness, foolish talk, or crude joking. He's going back to help us see this. That it's referring to the sons of a disobedience, or those who refuse to believe the gospel. As he goes on, um, let's see, in verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Matthew Henry says, Dare we make light of that which brings down the wrath of God? And so the idea is referring back to the filthiness and foolish talk about sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness. So if you look on TV today and the shows and all that kind of stuff, you see that the, the, the majority of the jokes of the shows, the majority of the scenes that are set up are talking about adultery, talking about homosexuality, talking about impurity, talking about filthiness, making light of it. But as saints of light, when we make light of those things, we are making light of the very things that are leading these people contrary to obeying God to the lake of fire. Do you think that's appropriate? No. I mean, that's an obvious answer, right? Those who live these lifestyles are probably not believers, so their eternal destiny is hell. So why are we making light of what causes their damnation? I mean, I didn't know that that's what that said until I studied it out. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is heavy. Because if you take this out of context, you miss what's really going on here. It's not about us losing our salvation if we have some sexual thought or deviance or if we struggle in a certain area and are fighting the temptation and stuff. That's not what it's talking about. It's not there to scare us to be better people. Like if you do this, you're going to lose your inheritance. That's not the point. The point of this is if we make light of what's causing other people who are sons of disobedience, sons of disobedience is referring to disobeying the gospel. If we make light of that, then what are we doing? We're missing our purpose as being light in this world. We're missing what God has for us as saints, representing Him and being messengers of the gospel. And by the way, if you are flirting with these things, or even more than flirting, then repent now so that you will not be severely disciplined by the Lord. The Bible teaches us that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are secure in Him. But that doesn't mean that we won't be disciplined. In fact, the Bible teaches us that we will be disciplined. And when we engage in sexual behavior that is contrary to God's word, is contrary to His righteousness, what's going to happen is God will discipline you. And He will discipline you until you repent. And if you refuse to repent and you start causing damage and harm to the kingdom of God or to the church, it's very possible that you could, have, you could be ill and God could take you home. I'm not saying that all of these things contribute 100%. There's a direct correlation. But the Bible talks about this on a regular basis. So we need to be very careful. If you're struggling with this, get help. Don't play around. It's not something you can just leave in the background of your life. It's going to destroy you. You're either moving towards life or you're moving towards death. You can't be just neutral. It doesn't work that way. Continue on verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So what, what's, what's he talking about here? What's the context here? Well, this verse is still in the context of how we speak. Empty words, what are those? Those are words without wisdom. They can be deceptive if we allow ourselves to be deceived. So the wrath of God is no light. If I say to you, well, look, dude, just... Why not, man? Stop being so legalistic. Let's, let's have a couple of more jokes about sexual morality or twistedness of sexuality. It's fine. Just don't be such a loser. Those are vain and empty words. This is where we go, you know, I used to joke like that too, but um, because of what Scripture says, I want God to be pleased with my life. So I'm not going to be deceived with that. I'm not going to be sucked into this deceptiveness. See, 
all the first part of Ephesians taught us about who we were and what God has done for us. The last part of Ephesians is teaching us about how we live as a result of that. And God has transformed us to live righteous lives. It's still your choice. You're still a Christian if you don't. But boy, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> you're going to be disciplined. So do we want to please the Lord or don't we? We have to make that choice. Each one of us has to come to that decision. It is a big deal. Verse 7. Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Well, partners with who? Who is he talking about? Partners with those who are doing the sin or partners with those who are talking about the sin? I don't know. I mean, more than likely he's referring to those who deceive you with empty words. Okay? But it could be both and it would, wouldn't matter either way. But deceiving you with empty words regarding the sexual deviancy that has become so commonplace in our world is probably the right answer, in my opinion. I could be wrong. In our current culture and age, we are bombarded with imagery and temptation towards believing that sexual deviancy is acceptable and even normal. I mean, if you don't see that, you're probably living in Ohio somewhere. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't know. Never lived in Ohio. But my point is, this is happening. Are we slowly accepting it to be true? Are we slowly accepting that we can have fluid identity? Are we slowly accepting that we can have sex with whoever we want, whenever we want, and we can change that if we want? If I feel like I want to have sex with a man today and with a woman tomorrow, it's fine. And so I'm, I don't know, non-binary or whatever. Like, are we saying that's okay? What does God say? What are we accepting? Are we being like the frog that's put in cold water and then the heat is slowly applied until that frog is boiled to death because he can't sense that there's a change in the environment around him? Are we, the church, acting like that? Are we missing out on what's happening? Well, we should be missing out because we don't want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of what God is doing. And so this is a very strong warning to us to not only participate in the behavior of that, but also not to participate in making fun of it or talking lightly of it. We instead, and I don't have time to go into it, we're going to finish this next week, we instead should be going to these people with the words of life. Mm. We should be caring for them. We should be forgiving them when they, when they do crazy things to us, because they will, because they are spiritually dead. They're going to lash out on us. And this is a fear that I have even too, to this day. How do we approach people like that? Well, first of all, we have to be in their life in a way that they, it demonstrates that we love them, that we care for them. But the Bible teaches us here not to become partners with them, not to join them in their lifestyle, not to condone what they do, but to, to be a part of their life in a way that shows that we love them and that we're willing to be around them but not partners with them. It's just the whole idea of being in the world, not of the world, that kind of a thing. And so, when we get an opportunity and there's interest in their life from the gospel, then we share the gospel with them. I don't, con I don't agree with the idea of just jamming the gospel down their throat. Um, knowledge doesn't save people, but God, for some reason, uses the power of the gospel to transform people's lives. And he uses his servants to graciously and kindly present that to people, especially when they desperately need it. You know, you don't just force people medicine down people's throat when they're healthy. Well, we do now, you know, certain things. But you shouldn't, okay? <laughs> Without going into a political debate. Um, you usually give medicine to people that need it. And the gospel is the most potent medicine to transform people's lives. So we're going to stop here in verse 7 or 8. Um, I, have a, I wanted to get all the way to 14, but I think this is plenty enough to chew on today. I want us to be thinking about these things. And we're going we're gonna to stop um, here. And um, let me just pray for us. And then we're going to go into a, a, a short time of discussion and uh, time for ask, asking questions or whatever. And then, um, yeah, we'll move on. So, Father, thank you for your word. These are some hard words and some difficult thoughts. I pray that you would help us to to think through how they apply to us personally. Um, it's really affected me personally. It's so easy just to go through life and, 
and just ignore all this stuff and eventually adopt some of these things as being funny or just being part of the culture. We don't want that. We want to be mindful of how we live and what we say and what we think and what we do so that we're pleasing to you, but not just for the sake of pleasing you, but to be transformed into your image so that we can save other people and help bring them from darkness to light so they can have an eternity with you. Father, give us this heart. Give us this passion. Transform us into your image in Jesus' name.